Hi, my name is Christine Orr. I'm with Ringgold. Thank you so much for spending part of your morning with us. And if anybody didn't get to know, this is a 90-minute session, so we're in. We're in it. Um, and this morning, we're going to talk about um, metadata and persistent identifiers through the research and publication cycle. And um, the idea for this session came out of a conversation that Bruce and I had at the Frankfurt Book Fair last year. And um, my education on the production side of the workflow was always absent. So I, I call Bruce when I need to know things about what happens upstream. And we were chatting about um, persistent identifiers and metadata that get collected like way upstream in the research cycle at um, you know, the research phase and the um, authorship and submission phase and how, unfortunately, that doesn't always carry through all the way downstream. So when it, things get into publication, things get into analytics, some of the stuff that we collected upstream and would be super useful downstream kind of fell off the car on the way down the road. And I was shocked to learn this. Shocked, she said. Shocked to learn this. And so Bruce totally took me to school on this. And I said, My, we have to talk about this. This is, um, you know, we have customers. I work with Ringgold. And one of the things that, that our core thing that we do is we do persistent IDs, metadata for organizational entities. It's um, we do a, a large reference database of organizations that's proprietary. We also do the open ISNI identifier for organizations. But it's one piece of a very big sea of metadata and structured data and persistent identifiers that make up this whole corpus of scholarly research. So we were realizing that folks were embedding things way upstream, were then needed downstream. And I actually had a client come to me and said, well, we need you to like reinsert things that we lost along the way. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. We need to evangelize and talk about this. So we brought together folks today from all different phases of the um, scholarship, publication, and research cycle. So we're going to kick off with, with Bruce Rosenblum. He's the CEO of Anera to talk about production and conversion phases. A um, little historic perspective as well. Now we're going to move to Mary Seligi. Mary is um, with Canadian Science Publishing. She's a senior business analyst there. And they've got um, a portfolio of journals that's kind of going through a metadata makeover. And Mary's also involved in the JATS for Reuse project. Then we're going to um, hand it over to Sarah Whalen of AAAS. Sarah is the director of business strategy and portfolio management. To get an additional publisher perspective, AAAS has been doing some neat things with metadata and PIDs over the past few years. Um, and then Jen Goodrich from the Copyright Clearance Center's uh, RightsLink for Open Access and RightsLink suite of products. Uh, Jen is the director of product management there. And their product actually is driven by lots of good structured metadata. So she's got a great perspective. And then we're going to close with Howard Ratner. Howard is the executive director of Chorus. And he's going to talk about some of the changes that he's seen over the past four years and perspectives and needs from the funding community. So we're going to kind of take you through this journey of the scholarly and academic research cycle. OK? Um, one other bit um, on the housekeeping front. This is a virtual session. We're going to have questions from folks here in the room, but we also have people who are attending SSP virtually. Unfortunately, couldn't come to Chicago and be with us. So what that means is two things. We're going to have questions from folks, hopefully, over the internet. And if we have questions here in the room, we're going to have uh, Judy Hum Delaney here is going to come around, Phil Donahue style, with a microphone so that any questions you have in the audience, they will be able to hear as well. So we'll thank you for speaking into the mic when, you're, when your inevitable questions bubble up. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Bruce Rosenblum of Venera. Thank you, Bruce. Great. Thank you very much, Christine, and good morning, everyone. Um, I want to talk a bit about what's gone on with metadata over the last 30 years or so. Uh, because if you have this feeling or you actually understand that it's gotten more complicated, you're right. It has gotten a lot more complicated. So if we go back to the olden days of about 30 years ago, and in this business that really is the olden days, manuscript submission was that an author would submit a manuscript, possibly typewritten, possibly longhand, possibly both. This is actually a page of a manuscript that was uh, submitted by Albert Einstein. I think in the 1930s. It's actually an image from one of his uh, manuscripts. And what would happen with that is it would go through a peer review process. A revised manuscript would be uh, mailed in. Uh, you might add a few bits of metadata to the cover page. So you might add, for example, a received date, a revised date, an accepted date. But there wasn't an awful lot of extra metadata 30 years ago. You would then go through an editorial process. Uh, this is actually a page from 
uh, 15 years ago with the New England Journal of Medicine when they still copy edited on paper, and every single copy editor had a unique color pen, so they had a complete audit trail as to who made exactly what edits. You would typeset, you would proof, you would typeset any corrections that came in, you check the copyright forms. That was sort of the one critical piece of freestanding metadata 30 years ago. You'd print, and then your post-publication workflow is you'd basically ship the print to libraries. You'd wait for the third-party indexers to hopefully pick up your journal and index it in various bound volumes. You'd publish an occasional erratum or correction, and very rarely you might publish a retraction, and that was pretty much it. And the result would end up like this on a library shelf. Now let's change our flashback from 30 years ago to 15 years ago. By 2003, a significant number of manuscripts were actually being submitted electronically rather than on paper. The, a, if you were using one of the nascent uh, online submission systems in 2003, there would typically be some sort of a transmittal file that would accompany that manuscript. And you might have then some non-redundant metadata for example, received revised accepted dates might be in that file, an article ID, uh, an article type, and those would either be retyped into a Word file or copy and pasted across. And then you'd find some way to electronically typeset that file and edit it. You'd still be checking copyright forms in 2003, and then at some stage, XML might be produced. This is still sort of early days of full text XML. Post-publication, you'd post it online, you'd upload your metadata to Crossref by 2003, you'd ship the print to libraries because we were still largely print-centric then. Uh, you might begin to archive XML and PDF. You'd publish an occasional correction or retraction, uh, correction or erratum, and then you might rarely have a retraction. And notice I've gone from very rarely to rarely with retractions. Those did start to pick up pace. All of a sudden, we stepped back and five years ago, new initiatives were just bursting onto the scene. We had ORCID really start to take hold five years ago. We had FundRap, again, 2013 is about the point this came in. And we had Chorus really get started up in 2013. And all of a sudden, what's driving all of these things and allowing them to play together is additional metadata. So if we flash forward to today, what happens is you submit the manuscript electronically for almost all journals, and in the process of doing that, the author fills out form after form after form. How many of you have actually submitted an article for publication? How many of you liked that process? <laughs> for those who are virtual, no, none of the hands are still up. I just recently was co-author of an article in Learned Publishing, and it took my corresponding author 30 minutes to submit a four-page manuscript. So there's something that's just not quite right with this process. And you know, part of this is we're being asked to add lots of extra metadata. We may be asked to copy and paste all the affiliations and authors from the Word file. I'm, I'm assuming here, yes, there is LaTeX out there, but I'm assuming most people are working with Word. Copy and paste that across into the forms, and you've got a field that you've got to break the author names into given names and surnames and so on. But wait a second, that's all in the Word file. And the funding information, when it, how, how many of you are collecting fund ref information? Okay, I'm seeing some hands go up. How many of you then have to manually cross-check that against what's in the acknowledgement paragraph in free-form text? Yep, I see a few. That's not a fun process. So we've got this dichotomy of what we're collecting in our online submission forms and what's in the Word file. And then we go into e-production 2008 style, so you've now got a Word file and a transmittal file from the submission system coming in, the copy editing all happens in the Word file. And then at some point you need to go and reconcile the metadata that's in the transmittal versus what's in the Word file. And that's where I stop and say, you're doing what? Well, yes, I just mentioned the point of checking FundRef against acknowledgement, but how many of you then go back and also cross-check, are all the authors from the submission system also the same ones that are in the Word file? Same thing with the title. Do they exactly match? Do the abstract match? Well, this is nuts because we've now got multiple sources of the same information. But what typically happens is the XML is going to be produced from the content of the Word file, and then we've got to do this messy merge of information. And then post-publication, 
You're going to post it online. You're going to upload metadata. We assume from the XML file that was largely created from the Word file. You may still ship print to libraries. You may not. And now you've got to comply with a bunch of funding agency requirements, all of which are just laced with lots of metadata. Uh, you have archiving requirements. You publish an occasional correction or erratum. You publish now an occasional retraction. Again, the curve of retractions has been going up faster than the curve of publication. And so it's just a lot messier. But there's a problem, and I was alluding to this a moment ago. Some of the metadata is only in the Word file. The full and final author list is typically going to be more reliable in the Word file than it is in the submission system, and also the order of the authors. The acknowledgments, again, the freeform text issue of where the funders are. Some of the metadata is only in the transmittal. ORCIDs are only in the transmittal, because if they're in the Word file, it means somebody copy and pasted it there, and that violates, violates rule number one of ORCID, which is never, ever, ever should an author copy and paste an ORCID. Uh, the institution IDs are going to be in the transmittal file, not in the Word file, the fund ref information, and potentially the copyright and licensing information. And some metadata is in both, because the author was made to copy and paste it into the submission system during the submission process. So in traditional e-production, as it was built out uh, in the early 2000s, what you have is a Word file, and that basically, that content flows through into the final XML file. But now that you've got things like ORCIDs, what you have are people trying to figure out how to get the ORCIDs in. And this slide comes from a presentation given by Nature four years ago, so I can't guarantee it's still current, but in that presentation, they pointed out that the ORCIDs were manually added to the XML by copying and pasting from the transmittal file into the XML file. How many of you know what an, uh, what an authenticated ORCID is? Most of the room, okay? You copy and paste an ORCID, it is no longer authenticated. So they were violating the terms of authentication. So what happens in a modified e-production system is what was going on at Nature. You have the Word file, you make the final XML, and then you've got this separate course where you take content from the transmittal file and you have a manual process to add it to the final XML. That's not guaranteed to be accurate and it's certainly not sustainable at high volumes. And what happens with this is this is where metadata gets lost. And this is the conversation Christine and I had in Frankfurt, that you're creating the full text from the Word file, and that copy and paste is time consuming, it's error prone, and so people do only what's essential. So there's a lot of metadata that's essentially being collected in the submission process, and potentially earlier now, I was at the ORCID breakfast this morning, and we were talking about uh, collecting metadata even at the point that people are applying for grants and getting that into ORCID records, which is very cool. But all this metadata just isn't quite making it into the final XML, or if it is, it's doing it in a very uh, poor way. And so this is the metadata that's being dropped on the floor, and it's becoming more and more important. And you may say, well, maybe it is okay to do it manually. Well, the, is it pronounced LIGO? LIGO? The paper last year that had 4,500 authors, I believe half of the world's <laughs> professional astronomers were in this paper. I have the begin, they, they ordered their authors alphabetically, so I have the beginning of the list and I have the end of the list of this paper. No one's going to get 4,500 orchids if they had them for every single author, copy and paste it manually and do it right. I challenge you to make that happen. That is an enormously miserable task. I mean, yes, it's very mechanical. Some people have the patience and discipline to do that, but that's just not a sustainable workflow. So basic rules of metadata. The first one I had written on my slide, enter once, enter right. And at the ORCID breakfast this morning, uh, they had enter once, reuse often. So we're, uh, we're thinking about the same basic ideas. You never want to rekey things. You never want to retype things. You never want to copy and paste. Don't do manually what you can do automatically. Don't burden the authors with more administrative tasks than they need to do, especially if you're throwing out that metadata. Go back and revisit what you're doing if that's what's really going on. Do validate things early and often. Do single source your metadata, uh, which is, again, that, uh, as Orchid says, enter once, reuse often, and do re-optimize the workflow around this. And there are problems with why this manual step is going on. So as I mentioned, you've got orchids in particular in 
um, only the transmittal file, but the authors are in both. And the reality is today's e-production is built on 20 years of history. So to suddenly take that and re-engineer the e-production to take the authors from the Word file and the ORCIDs from the transmittal file, the easiest thing to do is to add a copy-paste step. It's better to build automated solutions. And those solutions are starting to appear. And one example is that Aries Systems, in their next version of Editorial Manager, is automatically extracting the author's uh, key metadata, author's affiliations, title, and abstract from the manuscript. It cuts down the copy and pasting for the author, makes for better author experience. But then there are steps, and there are some organizations that have done this, that do an automatic reconciliation between the transmittal and the manuscript to compare the authors and then fill in the orchids automatically using a bit of fuzzy logic. And so what you end up with is what I call a corrected e-production workflow where you've got these two files in parallel, the transmittal and word file, and you feed them both into an automated reconciliation process. And from there, you get the reconciled metadata in the final XML. And that's really the right way to approach this kind of a problem. It's not without its challenges because, for example, you might have in the transmittal file initials for uh, author Smith versus full given names. Uh, you might have accented letters versus not in one file versus the other. And of course, if you ever deal with papers coming from Korea, you can have 30 authors and half of them have the same surname of Kim. There are challenges with institutional IDs. Mary's going to talk a bit more about this. And of course, the fund draft challenges I alluded to a moment ago. And finally, just really quickly, there are license challenges. And I give you this as an example of something I pulled from a real XML file. It was CC BY on the href, the link to the license. But if you read the text where it says, does not permit commercial exploitation, that is not CC BY, folks. But I can tell you this happens a lot, that there is a disconnect between two pieces of metadata that should be essentially the same thing. So what do I advise as next steps uh, in 2018? The first is review your metadata needs, review your metadata workflow, implement a reconciliation and QA process that has automation in it. And if you're using a vendor for this, go and audit your vendor. And what I mean by audit your vendor is actually go on site and watch the process being done for manuscript. So it's really what they say it is. It's not something different than what they say it is. Uh, so my quick conclusions, uh, unlike 30 years ago, People are no longer throwing print issues over the wall to the library, and that's it, you're done. The world is much more interconnected and complex. Uh, scholarly publishing is really more integrated than ever uh, in so many different ways. And that integration drives new initiatives. If we didn't have this kind of integration, we couldn't have something like Chorus, which is what uh, Howard's going to talk about, and a bunch of the other initiatives that our other panelists will talk about. But that integration, for it to work, it requires not only more metadata, but it requires reconciliation processes and it requires accurate metadata for, this, for all of these initiatives to succeed. So my last point is review and revise your metadata workflow with these points in mind. Thank you very much and we'll take questions afterwards. So Mary, you're up. Hi everybody. Ooh, so this is the previous slide. So, okay, so uh, today uh, I'm talking to you from Canadian Science Publishing. We are a publisher of about 24 scientific journals, uh, publishing the gamut of scientific uh, disciplines. And what I want to share with you this morning is what I think of as our metadata makeover, which is really part of a larger exercise to get into our article objects, including our metadata, and do a little bit of cleaning up and improving. So what I really want to talk with you about this morning is why do it? Um, because we've been making metadata for a long time. We've been publishing for a long time. And like all of you, when you've been doing something for a long time, you develop systems and tools and workflows and processes. And it's not that easy to change them. And you know, it, it, can, cost, it can cost money, and it can be a lot of hard work. But I kind of think of um, 
I kind of think of metadata as like a, a special and really important cupboard that we have. It's kind of like a kitchen cupboard that I have at home where I keep all my spices and sugar and salt. I use it every day to make what I have to make, but I don't necessarily look at what's in the cupboard. And once in a while, you, you got to do that. You got to open the cupboard and see what's really going on. And this is kind of what Bruce was alluding or describing in terms of, of auditing your stuff. You know, you've got to get in there. And that's basically what we're doing. We are opening the virtual metadata cupboard, looking in there and seeing, you know, is this stuff still fresh? Is it still usable? Is it still, does it still make sense for us to have what we have in our cupboard? You know, are there things that we're missing? Because we know there's things we're going to want to make or do later on. Do we have everything we need? And probably most importantly, speaking to Bruce's other point about how integrated everything is today, making sure all of our metadata in the cupboard is really well organized and labeled in a way that other people or systems who want to take from the metadata cupboard can be assured that they're getting what they need or want to be getting or what we want to be giving them. So we didn't just decide to do this on the fly, um, just sort of randomly. We have a golden opportunity before us at CSP, and that is that we are undertaking the redevelopment of our major journals web platform. And you all know when you've got a website, even if you control everything, um, which most of us don't, because a lot of us are on web platform hosts or web host platforms, you know, you're, once your display is set up, you're pretty much married to the way it is. It's not that easy to change things. So we're taking this opportunity to uh, really take a good look at, at what we're serving up metadata-wise and how we're presenting it. We know that there's a lot of things that we want to add, and we want to make this as useful and usable by readers and also systems as possible. So. One of the things that's been, there's been happening all these years that we've been publishing and making metadata is that there's a, a heck of a lot of content that's being produced. Uh, this comes from a research article that was actually uh, published by the University of, uh, by a person from the University of Ottawa, which is where we're from, and they estimate that there, by 2034 there's going to be like 100 million scholarly articles out there, that's a lot. So of course there's the obvious challenge, how will we distinguish our content from other people's, but there's also, for the purposes of this discussion, the challenge of disambiguating authors from one another, institutions from one another, you know, article objects from one another, and so forth. And of course this is what has effectively given rise to this new category of metadata called persistent identifiers. And this is something that we, you know, need to get with the times and start integrating because this is a, a, a very uh, important thing. And then along with this we have what I think of as two kind of uh, forces that are really shaping metadata standards, particularly in scholarly publishing, and one of them is openness. And of course this, you know, we're all going to think of open access and we're, we publish open access journals uh, along with paywall journals, so this is something that's important to us. We have to get the permissions area right, the licensing, and as Bruce rightly pointed out, the copyright. Uh, of course, you want to get those things right in your non-OA journals too. But really, I'm talking about the larger idea of openness. So uh, for us, as a not-for-profit, openness is a very important value. So, you know, for example, having open citations, making sure our metadata is, is as complete and available as possible is important to us. So recently, uh, we participated in CroftStress beta testing for uh, participation reports, and, you know, we we had a few little surprises there about what was actually being deposited, stuff we have to work on to make sure our metadata is actually as available as we think it is. And then we have the idea of transparency. You know, we're, this is another core value of ours as, a, as an organization, which is one of our business reasons for looking at our metadata again. Uh, but it's definitely a force that's shaping metadata out there. So it used to be that it was enough just to include enough metadata to cite the article, but now uh, it's common practice and even expected to include these other types of metadata which tell you something about the provenance of the work. You know, like was this thing on a preprint server before? You know, data availability. Can I get the data that underpin the, the core conclusions of the work? You know, funding, all that stuff. And um, 
these really comprise what I think of as the publisher's most important job after our first job of making stuff published, like publicly available, which is to provide these assertions of authority and legitimacy that enable humans and machine systems to trust what they're getting in the content. And talking of machines, so another thing that has been changing as scholarly publishing fully enters the digital age is arguably today no human reads content before a machine does. Machines are the gatekeepers of all the places in the scholarly publishing universe where we need and want our content to go uh, for discovery and dissemination and exchange and reuse and so forth. So aggregators, indexers of course, digital catalogs, databases, search engines, all those places. And machines are not very flexible, they're not human-like in that way. They need inputs that are predictable. They need them to be consistent and really accurate and detailed. So this is another reason why we are looking in our metadata cupboard and particularly in the XML of this, not just the handling of it in display, and ensuring that this is all accurate and complete. You can think of metadata really as like a passport for your journal article. Um, it, just as our real passports have to be accurate and complete and in a kind of standardized form, journal article metadata is pretty much like that. And you need this, the whole package, to be able to ensure that your content goes everywhere it needs to. So what exactly did we decide to do in the way of our metadata makeover exercise? Two categories of things. One is improving some things. And probably the notable thing on this list, the one that's going to be the most challenging, I think, is the article relationships. So we produce uh, scientific articles which sometimes generate a lot of discussion. And then you can have replies to the discussion, replies to the replies, and so forth. And you have this huge conversation around the science but right now, we have no great way of effectively presenting that in either the encoding in the XML or in the display. So this is something that we want to improve. And then, of course, we're going to add a bunch of things because, you know, as Bruce mentioned, there's like tons more metadata that we need to uh, include. So ORCID IDs, which is, uh, of course, in the category of persistent identifiers, uh, some of these other things. But I think, for me, that one of the most important things that's uh, really important is article publishing events, which dates, which for us is important. So we publish our articles in the ahead of print, for, or sorry, the accepted manuscript form. So after they pass through peer review, but before they've gone through the rigors of copy editing and the negotiations with the author. And we stamp that with a publication date, which is fine. But that date persists even after the article has been updated with the version of record or maybe some other tweaky version that we've done in between there. And this is truly a byproduct of the digital age of scholarly publishing where we publishers have this ability to continuously update, you know, and not but we don't necessarily have the mechanism for letting people know, hey, the thing I'm, you're looking at your, in your hand right now, this, this didn't actually go up on this date. It actually went up later than that. So this is something that we want to kind of address. Now, uh, as Christina mentioned at the beginning of this, I do work with the JATS for our uh, working group. It's a, in case you haven't heard of it, it's an international working group that has lots of different kinds of people from scholarly publishing working together to uh, develop best practices for capturing article metadata and other objects in JATS XML. And one of the things, so I've been working on the, uh, my group is the Authors and Affiliations Metadata Group, and one of the challenges that sort of was really highlighted in our work over the last six months is, you know, when we go to make changes, we publishers, we have to kind of balance the processes we've always had, our ed what we think are our editorial needs, versus the new, n new and evolving needs of dissemination and discovery. So case in point, uh, one of our main recommendations in our subgroup was that each affiliation element must contain a single and complete affiliation. So, for example, the, the affiliation you see on the bottom, Departments of Biology and Chemistry, that's, that's not a single affiliation. That's two affiliations. So each, de each department is its own affiliation, and if you are a publisher who uh, is interested in 
um, capturing the institutional IDs. There's a separate institutional ID for each one of these, and it's really important to be able to assign that, because otherwise, how is a, a system or a person going to know de definitively which affiliation you, you mean? So it's very important to have these teased out into their uh, uh, full and complete sets. But the, pro the challenge there is that a lot of public, well, I don't know about a lot, but s at least some publishers still have, the, still have their process of displaying this string of what we think of as partial affiliations all kind of glommed together. And they do this because I think it's scholarly publishing, you know, we think we're in the digital age, but really what we're doing is digitizing what we did in print. And that's not really the same thing as moving fully into the digital age, you know. We're just trying to recreate what we did before. So maybe now is a great time to be thinking about the goals of what we really want to achieve and not so much the processes we've always done. So thinking about discovery, dissemination, reuse, exchange, retrieval, search, those kinds of things. And just to finish off, this is something that's challenging, but we're not alone. There's a lot of working groups that are devoted to developing best practices around handling metadata or encoding it. Uh, Jatsvar happens to be the most notable one for the mandate of doing this in XML, and I'm obviously very biased. <laughs> but I think that what we could all do is uh, at least follow what these groups are doing. They're all starting to work together, by the way, and, and, and I think ultimately we'll probably have uh, tighter affiliations. And if possible, join. Because the whole point of this is to make a system where we're all singing from the same page and enjoy efficiencies and cost effectivenesses that we get from that. So thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Whalen. I'm the Director of Business Strategy and Portfolio Management for the Office of Publishing at AAAS and for the Science Family of Journals. Um, what that means is I oversee the publishing strategic framework, um, re the related matrix of projects, and also a few of the working groups. A quick overview of the Science Family of Journals. We have our flagship science, which is online and also in print. We have our open access journal, Science Advances, and then we continue with Science Immunology, Science Robotics, Science Signaling, and Science Translational Medicine. So I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of the whys and hows of our working group and our metadata experience, as well as um, our workflows and also um, existing industry standards that we're currently looking at. So the metadata group working group started um, when we began course, course compliance and also looking into FUNREF and ORCID compliance, um, as well as access control projects. Um, and also we are building a new content distribution ed engine, so we wanted to review our current metadata and figure out if we needed any additional new data, metadata, um, et cetera. So those were the main drivers. Uh, we've had several conversations about metadata in each of these you know, project meetings, and we decided that it was time to start a metadata working group. So some of the benefits of metadata that we discussed when trying to figure out if we should do the working group it, um, became a very long list. Um, we met thinking we would have four or five our benefits listed for why we should do it, and we ended up with a list of about 21. So these are just a few. Um, there's the basic, you know, it's the DNA of an article from submission through publication. Um, if you implement taxonomy terms into your metadata, then that will greatly improve ad serving and content feeds um, and could p expand product potential. Um, it also uh, leads to improved SEO. Uh, so much so that we started a, an SEO subgroup led by our product development manager, Hannah, Hannah Heckner. Um, so we're working side by side with her on SEO improvements as well. Um, it also will help enable open access pilots. Um, it'll include uh, better flexibility with um, access control as well. Um, and then there's the basic um, easier implementation of initiatives and services across all of our journals. 
So that just makes everything a little bit easier. So we outlined the goals for our metadata group, which is um, to analyze our current state of metadata, standardize metadata across our journals as much as possible, create as rich metadata as early as possible, and then also ensure compliance with, compliance with emerging industry metadata standards. So a quick overview of our metadata history. Um, in 2014, our IT department built what is our current um, content tracking system called CTS. Um, so that was 2014, and in that system we added typical article metadata, you know, volume, issue, figures, you know, just the standard um, basic metadata for articles. Um, we added some new author metadata, which included uh, full contact information, ORCID IDs, and Scopus. Um, and then we also started to add person metadata, which basically means um, AAAS member IDs, social media sites, um, which can include LinkedIn, URLs, uh, Twitter handles, lab web websites. Um, and then also we implemented ORCID IDs. And in 2015, we added taxonomy terms, field codes, and simil similar articles um, for greater discovery of our content. Uh, in 2016, uh, we started adding funder, grant number, and grant recipient information, as well as linking funder information back to individual articles, which makes science an outlier in that sense in that we're closing the loop on um, the funding metadata. Um, and also in 2016, we did JET conversion, which also enabled greater license and reuse terms metadata. 2017, we did cross-check score, article transfer information between our journals, and additional grant recipient information. And then earlier this year, we started adding additional person metadata, um, which includes gender, birth year, race, ethnicity, highest level of education, um, degree information, which is not required and stays within our content management system. Um, and then we also began uh, adding credit metadata, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a later slide. A little bit about our final XML uh, metadata workflow. Uh, I'll just take you through this quickly. Um, we import metadata into the manu manuscript file, and then our copy editors use um, ORCID integration suite for ORCID, ORCID authentication. And then we also include um, and confirm credit author contributions. Um, we confirm and include funder information. We strip out the demographic metadata, metadata, which is most of our person metadata that I discussed, and then we export the file for final XML creation. Um, and then once the information turns into a final XML file, we uh, downstream to several services, um, which I show here in this chart. Um, the final XML typically goes to Crossref, which then feeds it to ORCID, FunRef, and Chorus. Um, it's also fed to PubMed for our family of journals, and then to PMC for our um, open access journal science advances. And then the files are also sent to all of our abstract and inde indexing services, which the list is a little too long for a slide. Um, <laughs> So some of the emerging, emerging industry standards that we're looking at right now um, include, it's not limited to, we're still looking um, at what's out there, but these are the top ones that we're considering, um, is FAIR, which is, stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. It's a Force 11 um, industry standard. Uh, PRISM, which is publishing requirements for industry standard metadata. And it's basically metadata across multimedia. multimedia. Um, and then I mentioned earlier is credit, which is contributor roles taxonomy. And this um, kind of redefines what authorship means and can uh, attribute roles from anywhere from acquisition to funding. And then we're also looking at IPTC, which is metadata standards for photos. And then finally, um, Howard's going to discuss this further in his presentation, uh, Metadata 2020, which is open metadata for all research outputs. Some lessons learned so far, we're about midway through our working group goals. 
um, and some things that have popped up that I think would be useful for other people to consider when thinking about metadata is um, there's been a lot of industry conversation about getting buy-in for metadata from internal groups to actually want to make changes to the metadata and enrich it. Um, we found that by identifying our internal needs and balancing that with the external benefits of metadata standards um, and also attaching those needs and benefits to existing projects within our company that uh, it made it easier for people across departments to understand the use and need for richer metadata um, across the board. Uh, industry initiatives are existing solutions, so I recommend researching and keeping up to date with all of the upcoming um, industry initiatives. Um, the solutions can be there, it can save you time, it can save you money, um, and it's very useful when putting together a working group and a project plan. Um, standardization across journals is very important, it, it will make um, any industry initiative implementation much faster and easier. Um, it also enables you to implement services across the journals in a much, much easier and more efficient way. And then um, last but not least is timing. It's very easy to underestimate how long it will take you to enrich and review your existing metadata. Um, we recommend that you, one of the first steps in your working group is to map out your existing metadata within your internal systems and then also within your um, external vendors and services. Um, you'll quickly see from that map how complex metadata can be from different terminology to some metadata coming into one system but not going out um, to the next. Um, it can be very complex. Um, and then finally, um, this is an ongoing process. Our working group uh, meets currently once a month to reach our four stated goals, um, but we also plan on meeting quarterly after those goals are met to continually review industry initiatives and uh, the performance of our existing metadata standards. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jennifer Goodrich. I'm from CCC, and I'm the Director of Product Management for our RightsLink author product. <clears throat> and this product helps publishers collect APCs, or article processing charges, from authors for gold open access. So I was asked to participate in the um, panel today as an example of how a downstream system from the submission system from the author platform how when the metadata isn't persistent and it isn't standard, how it disrupts automation and services downstream. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about open access and why the metadata matters, what's working well and what's not working so well, and some recommendations. So why does open access matter? There's different numbers out there, but about 27% of all scholarly output is available in some form of open access today. And as you probably know, there are mandates all over the world to make scholarly research output and the data behind it all open by 2020. Well, that's right around the corner. We're probably not going to make it, but it is a goal and it is stated by many funders. What's interesting in open access is that the relationship between, in publishing, which used to be between the author and the publisher, now includes many more stakeholders. It includes the institutions that the researchers work for, it includes the funding agencies, and that complexity is driving a lot of different behavior. So in, in, the, in the funding world, there are, um, there are thousands and thousands of funders, and they all have mandates and requirements about publishing. So it can be about what license the article is published under, what is on the invoice, 
uh, what data has to show up in downstream reporting that institutions who get block grants have to report back to the institution. And this slide, you can see, this just has Outsell's Funder 5. These are the most influential funders in Outsell's recent report. These five funders alone support $53 billion worth of funding for research. A portion of that goes to APCs. A portion of that go goes to making the data open. But it's, it's a lot of money, and there's a lot of impact here. So, oops. Oh. Oops, sorry. I may have done that. Sorry. Oh, going all the way to the bottom. Sorry. Oh. Let me get you back on track. All right, one second. Sorry, I'm one sorry. second, guys. That's okay. We're going to go back. Oh, yeah, I think it went all the way to the bottom. Oops, that was me. That's all right. Easily fixed. You can go right uh, here. I'm going to go right here. Ta -da. Okay. Okay, so... This slide was just meant to show you the various stakeholders and how they're involved in the workflow at various stages from the um, uh, submission process through APC funding. Oftentimes, um, funding requests have to be approved before the article can be published, out to payment. Um, and so what does metadata really have to do Oh, I just did it again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. What button is it? We're going to put an X on um, that button. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry, That's guys. Okay. <laughs> just keep chatting. Okay. So what I really loved about what Ross Pine at Springer Nature recently did is they've done a series of interviews and um, surveys with their authors. And the number of authors believing that OA is the future is changing. So in their last one, 91% of authors agree that OA is the future. Two thirds are hopeful it'll happen within the next 10 years, but progress is slow. So with open access, metadata is really the fuel for automation. And automation requires that the metadata is standardized, it's persistent, it's always present. In the automated workflow, these metadata elements drive pricing and discount rules, which enable publishers to honor special billing agreements or offsetting agreements with the institutions. So an author is an expert in their research area, they may be a fabulous writer, they don't really know the mechanics of paying an APC. So any time that we can automate the process and make it very author-centric and institution-centric and funder-centric, the better it is. Um, the automated workflows also provide the institutions and funders with the pertinent and accurate information through the funding approval workflow which decreases the number of touches and minimizes offline manual efforts, which can be costly and time consuming. So open access, part of the uptake of open access is driving up the costs and making it easier for everybody. Any time that the automation gets disrupted by the lack of metadata, so if a publisher wants to honor a subscription level of a subscribing institution, but that affiliation doesn't come through, that ringgold ID isn't passed to us in the metadata, we can't fire a rule that discounts that APC based on that ringgold ID. So there's lots and lots of big deals and offsetting agreements out there, but without the author affiliation, without the funding information, without being able to dictate what license should be applied to the APC automatically, everything breaks down. So what's working well? In terms of standard metadata, ORCID IDs, we're getting more and more. That's a great thing. We're getting standard publication names and ISSMs. We're often getting DOIs now at the time of submission and not just at the time of publication. That helps everybody hook up the data all the way across. License types, Creative Commons license types, standard license types are coming through pretty well. And different types of manuscript statuses. 
what is not working well and what's preventing automation and driving up the costs and inefficiencies is this lack of author and co-author affiliations, funder names and funder IDs, and grant IDs. The co-author information can often be as important as the primary or corresponding author information. So as you're working to get your metadata in order, it's super important that you're also getting accurate affiliation and grant information for the co-authors on the papers. Here's a really nice quote that I really like because this is the impact when the metadata doesn't come through. I'll admit that one of the main reasons that we have to reject funding requests is because they haven't given us the funding information in the first place. The funding is the one piece of information we very rarely get. So vendors like RightsLink have built all of these sophisticated tools for automating the APC payment, approval, and reporting workflow. But these, the success of these tools is really partially predicated on publishers' upstream systems, their submission systems, their author platforms, their membership systems, and or production systems, passing that data down to us. And those systems are responsible for collecting the key metadata about the manuscript, the author, the research institution, the funder, and the grant, and then passing that down to us. In some cases, like this quote says, it's the insufficient data prevents the approval of the transaction. And if a publisher doesn't pass the licensing information along to other data points, then further down the line, a funder with a particular license mandate, like Wellcome Trust, who requires CCBY, they may not supply further funding to that researcher for their project, for future APCs, even though all of the other necessary pieces are there. This is another impact. A publisher may use our system, but they can't automate their offsetting agreements. So the author can come through, and we can fire pricing rules and discount rules, but we can't honor all of that work that they've done with their institutions to say, oh, you know, the, the first 10 transactions are free, or this institution gets a 15% discount off of our APCs because of their level of subscription. So this is, a, is another big problem that we run into. Um, sometimes the production teams can't go to production because they don't know what the right license information is, and they don't know that the APC has been paid. So that information has to flow from the publisher's system to RightsLink and then back into the publisher's system. They need to be able to take in the information about what license was chosen and was the APC paid. And then there's a lot of impact back to those funders. So that $53 billion worth of funding from those top five publishers alone, they all have questions that they're asking themselves about their funding and trying to decide if they're going to keep funding research and APCs and open access. So questions like, is information discoverable? Um, what license was un the article published under? What's the impact of my funding? If they can't tie back the funding to articles published and the institutions affiliated there and the institutions that got the funding blocks easily, that makes it really hard for them. So what are the recommendations? From where we sit, we really recommend that you do an audit. There are so many people that we talk to and publishers that we work with, they don't realize how many holes there are in their metadata. The metadata may exist in an upstream system, but the mapping to our system may have left out 10 really critical data elements, and they aren't really aware of that. Figure out why it's missing. Oftentimes, in the submission workflows, the editorial teams don't want to overburden the authors. Understandable. But in today's world, and as open access takes hold, you need that affiliation information, and you need to tell the author why. You need to tell them up front, I need these pieces of data. It's going to make it easier downstream. We're going to honor relationships with your research institutions. We're going to enable you to get future funding. 
So we recommend that you really talk about cross-functionally, cross-department, why is it missing and what do we need to do to make this more consistent? Because even if data is being extracted automatically out of those submission files, oftentimes there's still an affiliation with a Ringgold ID that has to happen manually and you need your authors, you need your folks to be doing that. Um, I think the why is so important and then you have to collect it always. You can't allow free text. You can't allow going around the standard identifier. So many systems have Ringgold integrations, but then they allow the author to, to, to free text an affiliation in. That doesn't work. We can't drive rules off of a free text entry. Nobody can track off of a free text entry. It's got to be from an ID. Always collect it, make it machine readable, and push it and pull it. Those are our recommendations. Thank you. So good morning. So I have the privilege of going last and hopefully not repeating everything that all of the speakers have already said, and I will do my very best here. You might notice that I put a five up here. So people have heard me talk before and always know that I put up my five fingers because that's about all I can remember. But this actually, this talk today is for me to talk about five things, but actually for you to walk out of here and think about what are the five things you want to do differently about metadata after you've heard all of our talks here. So not just mine, but everyone's. So a little bit about me. Um, as Christine said, I am the executive director of Chorus. But before that, and continuing to be that, I am a metadata and persistent identifier wonk. Um, I've been involved with industry standards really since 1999 uh, with Crossref and DOI, and then later on with ORCID and so forth. But let's get into it. So you heard some of the speakers talk about how many uh, policies there are out there from funders. Well, actually, there's data about that, right? So RoarMap is a great example of that. And RoarMap talks about 886 access policies that need to be tracked. And of course, each policy is a little bit different. Each one has variable requirements. And because research is increasingly uh, collaborative, You've got most papers having multiple fund funders. I'm um, Bruce did a great job of showing you how many that actually could be, uh, with multiple sources of funding, multiple institutions, and often multiple countries. So if you think about the possible permutations, and my colleague uh, David Crotty over at OUP would say the combinations of 880 variables are close enough to infinity that most calculators can't even figure it out. So I'm going to take David at his word that that would be true. So well, how does Chorus get involved here? So Chorus is a community effort trying to reduce the burden of complying with public access mandates. So you can see in one of our little circles there, you've got all the publishers and service providers, and we're hoping that more of you will join us in that effort. But more importantly is the fact that the community is not just about the publishing community. It's all about funders also seeing that there's a problem out here and that they know that that they need to improve. And so they want to work with uh, the publishing community and also the institutions to improve this. And that's what Chorus is really about. And, but I said I'm a wonk, right? So I helped build some of this infrastructure, so I want to make sure that we use this infrastructure. So we helped build this, and, and I want to use this to actually enhance the whole public access infrastructure. So how do we do that? Well. First off, I mean, this should not be a surprise to you because you all do this. You all submit information, what I call content DOIs, into Crossref. Alongside of that, you, uh, you input funder IDs into, into what is actually not, no longer called Fundref because Crossref renamed it. So it's actually part of their open funder registry. And that's what you actually should be mapping that all to. Once that happens, we can do some interesting things. So we can actually take that content DOI and check to see whether or not that 
uh, article has actually been submitted into one of the dark archives, uh, otherwise known as clocks and portico. So that's one thing we can do, and actually they give us that information back. Then we can also do more, right? So now if we have the content DOI and the funder ID, we can actually see whether or not an either an author manuscript or a version of record has made its way onto one of the agency portals because they have sprung up since 2013 and before that. So it's, uh, we have ways to track uh, NSF and USGS and of course NIH and the Department of Energy. Some of the agencies, very few of them, have given us a way to actually look up grant IDs within their systems. This is something I always talk to my agency partners about improving, because they don't do enough of it. NSF is one of the ones that's the best. They actually do a really good job of that. Of course, ORCIDs. We've heard a lot about ORCIDs, right? So if we have an ORCID ID, um, or rather the content ID, DOI, we can then figure out the ORCID ID as best as possible, and we do also absorb all of that. All of this goes into the metadata records that Chorus tracks for our member publishers. And the newest baby on the block for me is finally being able to connect up the content DOIs to their data set DOIs, and we've been able to do that through the Scalax initiative, and Scalax then in turn connects up, I have data site listed here, but it's a variety of different sources, Crossref being one, Pangaea being another, OpenAir being another. So we, in this one API to Scalax, I can find lots of really interesting data sets and report that back to the institutions, report that back to the funders, and they have found that to be particularly interesting. So what I was asked to talk about though is about why is getting metadata right critical for the funding community? So we really want to be able to identify the articles that are reporting on funded research. That's what we do. That's what the whole op open funder registry is all about. We also want to be able to disambiguate authors. This is key for the funding community. And as you've heard some of the other speakers talk, we really want to be able to properly credit contributions. So funders for their financial contributions, researchers for their work, and also, a newer thing um, that I think, Bruce, you were talking about this morning, is that the research resources are also a thing, right? So it's not just about the grants, but what equipment did they use? What lab space did they use for their research? Did they use certain kind of samples, whether or not that's biological samples or geological samples? Did they use a particular ship? to go on an oceanographic cruise. These are all actually pieces of the puzzle that make up research and actually can help solve some of the um, reusability stuff that we've been hearing about a lot. If you can be able to identify all of these things. And importantly, I always love following Copyright Clearance Center on this point, is to clearly indicate reuse rights, right? That was not true a few years ago, but it is starting to become much more true now. So the, 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 the box is being opened considerably. So actually, I was very fortunate, um, and I wasn't sure I was going to get this, but I, was, I asked some of my uh, colleagues over at, at the funding agencies whether or not they could supply me with some slides. You never know what you're going to get when you ask that kind of question. But actually, two of them responded. Um, Department of Energy gave me this slide. So this is verbatim. I didn't touch this slide at all. Uh, so you could see here that the Department of Energy has a division called OSTI, the Office of Science and Technology Information. They maintain something called eLink, right? I'm not going to read this out to you, but eLink basically is a manuscript submission system, okay? So after a grant has been given, they expect after 12 months an author to submit an author manuscript into the eLink system, okay? In that system is lots of metadata that they are collecting. They are collecting the contract numbers, names of laboratories, DOE's got lots of those, research organizations, of course funder names, because by the way, it's not just the DOE, right? There's multiple funding going on. I, you know, one of the beautiful things about working at Chorus is that we can see, hey, this, this article and the research behind it was funded by the Department of Energy in the United States, but also it got NSF funding and it might have gotten some funding from the Japan Science and Technology Group, whatever. Um, all of this is populated via metadata. So, of course, they get information from Crossref, things like titles and authors, and uh, they look up ORCID IDs as well, and, and publication dates and journal information. All of this, actually, they ingest and use for their systems. 
and they do use persistent identifiers like DOIs. So this is um, also their slide. And you can see here that they actually point all of this towards two of their, what I, I will call, portals. One of which is asti.gov, okay, which I'm sure every single one of you has been there. And the other one, more likely you've heard of, is something called the Pages system. That is their public access repository. That is where they actually will, will point to an author manuscript or a version of record if you're a chorus member. They'll point to those, and they'll actually hide their own versions. Or if they don't get it from a publisher through a link through Chorus, they'll actually ask the author, and they will actually uh, show it up on their site. Okay, that's, but all of that is driven by the metadata. Okay, so the metadata has to be clean. The metadata has to be there and present for them to get it. Now, NSF's a little different. Okay? So NSF has a very integrated approach. One of the things you didn't hear me mention when I was talking about DOE is I didn't really mention too much about their grant system. Because that's the OSTI group and the DOE grant people are actually two separate groups. This shouldn't surprise you about our government that they're different. <laughs> NSF has actually done a really good job. When they thought about this, they said, no, 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 we actually want this all to be integrated. So they are actually using Department of Energy technology for the display of information, and they call theirs PAR, or Public Access Repository, okay? But what they have done is all the metadata that is collected first through their research.gov um, thing, um, that all of that is collected via research.gov, and then it connects up through, again, Chorus and, and Crossref and a variety of other input me mechanisms, okay? into a really robust PAR system that allows them to, once again, display author manuscripts if they've collected it, but if they found it through uh, Chorus, they will link to the version of record or the author manuscript found on the publisher's site. But this, but this is all about metadata in the end. But let me talk about some of the things that I have seen over the last four years. I am not calling out any particular publisher's names because you're kind of, you're all guilty. <laughs> So let's talk about persistent IDs in general. So DOIs and ORCIDs. Well, one of the most interesting things that I've discovered, and you know who you are in the room, you've been gathering up all of these DOIs, you've been gathering up all these ORCIDs, you've been making these authors, uh, maybe even doing the cutting and pasting thing, and you've been gathering them through your manuscript tracking systems. ORCID's never seen them. Crossref's never seen them. But yet, they sit in your production system. Awesome. That doesn't help anybody, folks. Okay, get them out of your system, right? Get them into the registrars where they belong. Do the right thing and authenticate them when you actually can, right? Publication dates. Well, yeah, where do I start? Um, so publication dates are not standardized whatsoever, right? They're a mess. Um, there are online dates, there are print dates, there are AM dates, there are VOR dates, version of records, sorry. The, um, I actually tried, we tried uh, to use the, the Crossref data and actually tried to normalize that down to one date and say, yes, this is the publication date. We got burned so badly. So now what do we do? We list them all. And we say, you know, uh, buyer beware, but this is everything that exists within Crossref um, that we're seeing, and you can decide what you want from it and decide what's right. Um, it's tough. Publication dates need reworking. They need standardization. If people are involved in working groups, please focus on publication dates because God knows, you know, it needs work. Orchid IDs, right? Hey, I was a co-founder, right? I think it's they're really important. But honestly, you know, because we we list them within Chorus, and we have the little green logo which I loved, right? There's about one, usually one per article. Who is that? That's the corresponding author. That's a good start, right? You've got to start somewhere, but it's really got to be about every single author, right? And it's got to be authenticated, as Ruth rightly said. So there's a lot of work yet to be done, and I think we heard one of the speakers, um, I think it was yesterday, who was like, you know, it's great that we have this ORCID thing, but there's just not enough of them. It's true. There's just not enough of them. And affiliations. Well, you know, this is the great open country as far as I'm concerned. 
right? I know Christine, you know, will talk about ISNEs and so forth, and that's fine, there, but there is truly no widely used open standard uh, that, that everyone is really gravitating towards. There is no like ORCID or Crossref or, you know, anything like that for organizational IDs. There are very specific uses, com great commercial uses like Ringgold and so forth, but no one has really gravitated and said, this is the one. And there's a lot of work being done right now between Crossref and ORCID and, and some others, and I think 2019, that's going to be the year that we're going to break that, and we're going to have a watershed moment. I really do hope so. So keep, you know, keep that in mind, because I certainly will be looking for it, because, gosh, it's got so much use. I got another page of these. So this is the last page of my comments. So article record changes. This is tough. Um, we see it a lot. So yeah, gen generally around January. Um, <laughs> articles will move from one publisher to another, because maybe a society's gotten fed up with a publisher, or whatever the reasons might be. Well, there's actually no, not really good recording of the transfer of journals from one to another. And this is, this is a problem, and it breaks systems like mine all the time. Because there's no, like, change flags about the fact that it just moved from, you know, commercial A to commercial B. Or maybe it's been society A to society B. Less likely, but it could happen. Um, this is something that, you know, downstream, we would like to have this information. Because otherwise, we have to build some logic to figure this out. Platform vendor changes. <laughs> um, we ingest data every night. So in, in and around uh, two months ago, one of the major publishers went live, right? Yay, on a platform. <laughs> Everything that they had, every bit of metadata that they had about their author manuscripts broke, just gone. And our dashboards went, mm. okay. I mean, this, but this is a service that we offer, right? We have publisher dashboards, and this is sort of the reason for that is so that we can help you check your metadata, right? But gosh, when you do a platform change, it's great that your new data is going to be nice and pristine. Make sure your legacy data comes along with it, or at least keep it stable somehow until you're ready. Because boy, when you're downstream and you see that change happen, it's brutal. It is brutal. And then reuse licenses. This is a fairly recent development, so I cut all of you slack about this. But this is something that we help push because reuse licenses are near and dear to the heart of Chorus members. Um, very non-standardized use of start dates. Uh, this is kind of a problem. Some people start it you know, at the time of publication. Sometimes it's meh, maybe about two months after that. It's almost arbitrary. So this is, so the start date thing is something that I know that the, the Crossref community is really starting to look at because as, as people are using these, this, and it's not just you know, us, you, you have to think, how are they using this data, right? So if you've got a reuse license there and it's a CCBY and you say a start date, but yet it's on your site and the site already has CCBY on it, but yet the metadata is saying that it's two months from now, what's going on, right? Why is that happening? And this is all about clean metadata, so make sure, and this is important, it's not just the production people anymore, so now it's the business people who are setting the terms and maybe not communicating that appropriately to the people that are doing the metadata. You gotta make sure this is all right because, hey, lots of systems now, by the way, are absorbing this and ingesting this. Yeah, and then you could talk about open access and whether or not it's public access. We use those kind of interchangeably. It's mostly because the U.S. government says public access, but you go to the Australians, they, they talk about open access. It's all about what can people get, when, and when, what can they do with it. So let's talk about Metadata 2020 a little bit. So Metadata 2020 is an initiative that started last year. It's all about helping to improve the quality of metadata for research. It is not a 501c3, it's nothing like that. It is a bunch of volunteers getting to say there's got to be a better way, right? There's just got to be a better way. So it's a collaboration, okay? And it's about 120 individuals. There are publishers, there are librarians, there are service providers like me. There are data publishers, repositories. Fun. It's across the board, okay? But they, they're saying there's got to be a better way to improve our metadata. And they talk about, uh, we talk about, richer, connected, and reusable. But what does that mean? So richer metadata will fuel discoverability and innovation. That's important. The connectedness will connect metadata bridges between different systems and different communities. And reusable, of course, right? You want the stuff to be reusable. You want it to be open metadata. Key word, open metadata. And eliminating the duplication of effort, right? That is key. 
And I was really happy to see that ORCID is really embracing that, and I think we should all embrace that input once, reuse many times. So the 2020 projects, because yeah, hey, you gotta have one of these kind of charts, right? Um, <laughs> basically, if you look at this, I'm not gonna talk to how they all interconnect and so forth, but we've got six major projects that are going on in 2018. So last year, it was, it was all about formation and, and, and thinking it through. This year, it's all about uh, the six projects. One is P1, as we call it, researcher communication. So that's a real outreach to the researcher, trying to explain to the researcher why this is important. Two is metadata recommendations and evaluation mapping. So again, this is really important about how stuff maps to stuff. Uh, determining uh, three is defining the terms that we use about metadata. This, <laughs> that is a fun group because how we all talk about metadata, I'm, I bet you most of the people in this room mostly talk about metadata the same way, but I've had lots of conversation with funders and labs, pff, totally different ways of talking about metadata. So this is actually really important just to figure out how that goes. And then four is incentives for improving metadata quality. That's actually a lot, large part of what this panel is all about. And then mine, and I'll put my hand up here because I'm actually uh, one of the co-leads on it, is number five, which is uh, shared uh, best practices and principles, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. And the last is uh, P6, metadata evaluation and guidance. So a little shout out to my own, um, and Jennifer is actually in the room. She's my co-lead on this thing, or chairs, I don't know what we call ourselves. Because we're not, remember, we're not an official organization, we're just a collaboration. So our purpose for this uh, group is to build a set of high-level best practices for using metadata across the scholarly communication cycle in order to facilitate interoperability and easier exchange of information and data across the stakeholders in the process. So the first thing that we actually did is to just look across scholarly community and say, what are all the best practices that are out there? Right? And we came up with quite a list, and eventually we'll be publishing said list of best practices with no judgment about what it is, but just these exist. And actually, some of the, that work is really helpful, and, and you can actually use them in your own work. And out of that, we, will, we plan to uh, create some best practices um, for, for the overall uh, uh, initiative, as well as principles, because they, those go together. So let me impart with you five things that I think you could do, right? But you should think up your own, right? These are my five, this is my five things that you can think about doing. Tag your funders, tag your funders, okay? <laughs> but when you do it, you make sure you use the Crossref Funder ID system. Don't just make up the funders, right? There's a really, you can download a, the whole registry if you'd like from Crossref, there's an API to it. It's awesome, use the Crossref Funder ID. Tag your, your authors. I learned something, do, but do it with authentication. Don't copy and paste, right? I took a note on that, Bruce. Um, use the ORCID IDs, right? That's really important. Grow it, okay? Tag affiliations. You know, I'm gonna put my hand up and say, we've chosen to use GRID, right? You gotta, you gotta start somewhere because there is no really embraced standard uh, out there. But if you don't wanna use GRID, find another one, right? Use ISNI, use, you know, Use Ringgold if, if that's a service you bought into, because actually they will map to each other. But, but get it into, into there. Get it into your JATs. Post your article reuse policies. And then, by the way, make sure you register those at Crossref, okay? Because it's really important that people know what reuse policies you've ascribed to that article. And then the last one, remember I said set five. This one I've said before in many other pulpits, recheck, recheck, and update your metadata at least once per year, right? I said this to Bruce and he said, why once a year? I said, you gotta give them a minimum, <laughs> right? It could be more than that, but do it once a year. And that's it for me, so thanks. Okay, thank you so much to everybody. Five points from Howard, five speakers. This is all good. Maybe we'll have five questions. So I'm going to say we have um, Judy with a mic over here. And Yael, do we have any questions online yet from our virtual attendees? No? Okay, you never know. So anyone? There, there. Hi, thanks. Uh, is this on? Okay. Thanks, everyone, for a great presentation. 
Uh, I have a question, that, and it's sort of directed to uh, Sarah, but everybody else jump in. Uh, you, with, with the notion of a, a metadata working group, you sort of brought this idea of, of uh, cultural changes and cultural issues of, of metadata uh, onto the, into the discussion here. So I'm curious how that, that working group got started. Uh, how difficult was it to sell that within your organization? I mean, I think we all, everybody here understands the importance of metadata, but I think for a lot of uh, people in the rest of the organizations where we all work, it's, it's sort of a weird term. We've heard of it, but nobody really knows what it is or how to do it. H how did you uh, sort of sell that idea? And then uh, also a more operational, uh, who's on that working group? You know, not the individual people, but the kinds of people. Is it interdisciplinary or is it, is it sort of focused on one? Right, and that's a, that's a good question that I left out of my presentation. Um, first off, uh, the people that make up our working group are across all departments. So that includes IT, publishing, product development, analytics, digital media. Um, and I think that's a key part for the working group to actually work um, because each department looks at metadata differently, they use it differently, and they have different needs. Um, and so that, when we put together the metadata working group, um, that was our first goal was to make sure everyone was represented in the room. Um, and then I, I forgot that second, oh, the, se the second question was about how we got buy-in from all different departments. Um, so one of the first steps was we cr got together and created a list of the benefits for each department and each group. And, um, as I mentioned, you know, we thought it would just be four or five or that would be, we'd be scraping by to get you know, enough benefits to get buy-in. But we ended up having about 21 different benefits which translated into basically 20 different goals. Um, so that made buy-in much easier because then when, when we brought it to senior management to approve uh, starting the working group, um, they could each see their department within the goals of the working group. Um, so I'm not sure if that fully answered your question, but that's kind of how we did it. Uh, hi, uh, Monica Munich from Cameron News University Press. Um, I had a couple of questions, but I'll, I'll stick to one. <laughs> um, about open access, I think one of the problems, and this is a question, not just me thinking, um, is that People have different definitions of open access, still in publishing, but everywhere else. So can we maybe focus more on the license and less on open access? Because when people collect that metadata, they then label it as something as open access when it, it could be like green away or something like that. So maybe that should be a require overall. I agree. Actually, at Chorus anyway, we steer usually pretty clear of open access unless it's pushed on us, like by the Australians or something. But um, that's why we like public access, because actually it doesn't have any real meaning behind it. It just means, is it available to the public, right? Period. And when Chorus monitors for public access, we literally do that. Can our systems and can our people, and we don't subscribe to anything, sorry, um, can we access them? It's publicly accessible, that's it. And then, but then, the reuse license connected to that is really important. Just because I can access it doesn't mean I can necessarily reuse it, it just means I can access it. So we have to tie in, is there a reuse license here? And then where can you find that reuse license? Just to add to that, from the CCC side, all of our permissioning services. So again, we're taking metadata in from our publishers, and if you can't tell us that an article or a piece of content, and maybe soon book content, is under a certain license and open access, then we can't present that data back correctly to our corporate customers, to publishers trying to reuse other publishers' content, and that becomes very problematic. Um, this is Kristen Martin from University of Chicago, and I was curious for institutional affiliation. Um, we, I'm at the library, and we've been involved in a pilot project uh, with ISNI identifiers, and I'm wondering if you see that as a potential to help with um, the institutional disambiguation issues. Um, I can speak to ISNI a little bit. Uh, Ringgold is the registration agency for for ISNI uh, in the organizational ID space um, that crosses into this into this space. Um, 
an ISNI identifier, just to kind of back up, is a, um, it's a ISO standard, it's a bridge identifier. So what it carries is a unique 16-digit ID to uniquely identify that organization. Um, and then there's a bunch of kind of name variants and some very limited um, metadata. It is designed um, per the ISO standard to be a bridging identifier to link you from, you know, like for example, as Ringgold, you know, we link into ISNI, so every, um, you know, Ringgold organization with all of our, you know, internal proprietary metadata links to that. And then if someone else is using ISNI, oh, you can like hop from one to the other. Okay, so that's the function of ISNI. So it's a really, it's a nice starting point, but it also has its limitations. But as Howard mentioned, there are um, other sources as well, um, you know, for institutional, um, for affiliation specifically, um, you know, there's a couple, you know, a lot of people use Ringgold, some people are starting to use ISNI. I'd actually like to talk to you about how that's going. That would be really interesting. Some people are utilizing Grid, which is another open um, source. Um, you know, for funders, people are using, again, it's the same organizations again and again sometimes, uh, organizations that might be a, um, uh, an affiliation of one author are also in the um, fund, the open funder registry list. So, you know, there are bridges there as well. So it depends kind of what you're doing. So, and Anyone just to, want to take that too, can yeah. I can I yeah. supplement there because what what um, can be super important in the open access world mm -hmm. and why um, I think a lot of our publishers use Ringgold because of its hierarchy. So. Let's say I'm an author, I come in through Aries Editorial Manager, I self-identify that I'm a part of the University of Chicago, I identify that I'm a part of the chemistry department. We can fire a rule that says, oh, this, this person's a, a child of the University of Chicago, Publisher A has a relationship with the University of Chicago. Yes, this, this author from this department is eligible for that discount, that affiliation discount, that relationship, whatever it might be. And so the hierarchy can be super useful so that you don't have to map necessarily thousands of discount levels, right? You can map at an organizational level or whatever organizational level that relationship exists at. Mm -hmm. So that can be a very specific use case in an open access world, but I think there's a lot of value in the identifiers having the hierarchies. Is it at a, a consortia level? Is it at a university level? Is it a department level? I think it's like, a, it's like a pick the right tool for the job kind of thing. So depending on what are you trying to do, why do you want that affiliation? You know? Is it something more complex where a hierarchy is needed, or really are you just trying to disambiguate one for the other? Maybe a different tool is fine too. So it depends what your what's your end goal, why you're trying to get that affiliation. So. Mm -hmm. okay. Two questions over here. Oh yeah, so far. Hi, uh, Emily Marchant from Cambridge University Press as well. Um, Jennifer, I think you emphasized the importance of the why when talking to researchers specifically, and Howard, one of the projects from Metadata 2020 is also focusing on that. I was wondering, with the difficulty of uh, how much we ask researchers to do for us and how much we try to communicate to them, what have you or any of the other panelists learned about successful ways of emphasizing the importance of, of this? I think it's really hard because I think we all know that authors don't read a lot of help text and instructional information unless they run into a problem, right? That's what our usability says. But maybe as all of uh, the vendors and platforms, we have to think about redesigning how we do the messaging. Maybe we have to gate things a little bit more, but I think emphasizing the messaging in as many places as you can on your own website, in the submission system, in a, in a RightSync workflow, in the emails that you send to them, in the videos we present, and I think engaging the university community. So I was at the Research to Reader conference in, in February, March in London, and it was so clear how little so many of the institutions understand about the submission systems. What do my researchers go through? Why are you asking for all of this data? And when you start explaining it back, 
then they're like, oh, I get it. And then can you gate it a little bit more? Well, sometimes we can, but sometimes we can't because, again, we're trying to make an APC workflow author-centric. We're trying to make other something else author-centric, and if you just give us a little bit more data, everything else is going to be much easier for you downstream. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And then Howard. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just want to add one really quick comment. I think it was Evan Owens, who's in the room, made the comment a few years ago when he was at American Institute of Physics that literally on the uh, screen in the submission system where funding information was being collected, they had to add one simple sentence, please make sure the funding information you're adding here matches what's in your acknowledgement paragraph, and the, both the completion and quality of completed metadata collected shot way up. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's as simple as one clarifying sentence as to what your expectation is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Evan's nodding his head yes, I, so I didn't <laughs> mistranslate. Yeah, so... First of all, I'm going to say I'm really happy that I'm not the lead of that particular project because I think that's actually the toughest one. Mm -hmm. um, but watch that space on Metadata 2020. Hopefully, there'll be some really good outputs and some advice that we can all give mm -hmm. um, to our constituencies, right, about why this is important to them. But I, my opinion is you got to make it personal. You got to make, you got to say why is important to you as a researcher. Mm -hmm. You know, and funders can do that. Labs can do that. Publishers, we have, we have influence too, so we can do it too. But, but watch the Metadata 2020 space, because that's exactly what that project's about. Yeah, that is a tough one. I think, yeah, what's in it for them? It's, it's about discoverability. It's about can someone find this article that you worked so hard on? You know, I think that's a, a component. Just asking, oh, because we want it for our own purposes as publishers. They don't care, and that's fine if they don't care. But, yeah, what, how can we position it so that there's a value in it for them? And they'll spend an extra moment or two to give us the information that we need to make a workflow function to make their content more discoverable. I so I think we're yeah. just about Trial at, and error at too. time. We got one more, time for one more? Perfect. Um, hi, Tara Kelly, um, Science Journal, Serpo AS. Um, great talk, everyone. Um, I just wanted to um, ask about um, metadata validation tools and, and what might be suggested by anyone on the panel. Um, we have run into issues where we're collecting metadata, but the downstream can't use it or they're not using it yet. Um, we've also run into instances where we have valid XML. It validates perfectly. It's beautiful. And when we try to downstream it to cross-ref, it's, it's, it's rejected because um, there's a duplicate uh, ORCID or uh, there's a DOI uh, tag that's empty, something like that. So um, I'm wondering if there's any suggestions from the panel. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mary, we could take this one together and just say one word, which is schematron. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> a any of you who are creating XML and you don't have a schematron validation layer above it, uh, you should have that. If you don't know what that is, come see us after class. Uh, we'll be more than happy to explain it to you. Um, the other thing I always like to tell people is you can out, if you're using a vendor, you can outsource your work, you can have it done for you, but you can never outsource your quality assurance, and so you need to take responsibility for doing your own QA, whether that's investing in building your own tools, whether it's bringing in a third party to build tools for you, and there are companies that can do that, uh, but that's part of it. The other thing I'll just quickly add is anytime you've got two sources for data that you can compare, as I gave in my talk the example of the author list in the transmittal and the author list in the manuscript, build an automated system to try to compare them to make sure that things are in fact right. Great. Well, guys, I think we're at time. And just to wrap up, we saw metadata compared to the spice cabinet. It's the fuel that makes the automated systems go. <laughs> anyway, there was one more in there. It's, uh, it's the DNA that makes all this work. Well, I'll say for myself and all the other persistent identifier and metadata wonks up here, we're in love with this stuff. And metadata, this is someone else's line I'm cribbing. It's a love note to the future. It's a love note to future stakeholders. It's a love note to future researchers. So I hope we've encouraged you to kind of examine your own metadata systems and policies and start embedding it as much and as often as you can. So thank you so much. And we'll be here for questions for a few minutes if anyone has anything else. But thank you for spending some time with us today.